who will introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Sylvia Lee. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And also, I just wanted to thank everyone who um, submitted their responses. Um, to our request for feedback on the Diatom Web Academy. Um, your responses are what is helping us um, prioritize topics, and um, that's why we are um, having the webinar on this topic today. Um, and if you are curious about the um, survey results, I will post the link on um, the chat box to a summary of the feedback that we received from all of you. Okay, so now I want to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Jan Stevenson. He is professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at Michigan State University. Recently, he was recognized by the Society for Freshwater Science as an SFS fellow. SFS fellows are scientists who have led, shaped, and inspired the field of freshwater science. They are recognized for advancing our understanding in research, teaching, policy, and management. So with that, um, take it away, Jan. Well, thanks. Thanks for pick the introduction and picking up that tidbit. Um, so um, hello, everybody. I, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day, but I hope you're St. Patrick's Daying responsibly. Um, so I'm going to, uh, first I want to thank the Taxonomic Certification Committee for helping out with the presentation and trimming down a lot of ideas and highlighting the ones that would be the most important to bring across. <clears throat> uh, so uh, thank you everybody. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is really just an overview of how to use diatom data and ecological assessments. <clears throat> and, and the presentation uh, is geared toward an audience of grad students, postdocs, and resource managers. So it'll be a little general. And it will be a, an overview of just some of the key applications. Uh, and I'll have some examples of how it, they've been, uh, uh, these, of these applications in a variety of different things. So I'll probably skip over some things on some slides that are too much, uh, too detailed. Uh, but I've left them in kind of as placeholders for future discussions either today in the latter half of the hour or uh, in, in future webinars. So got a problem with uh, sufficient time to teach all the details of these applications. Um, <clears throat> but the solutions are, uh, there are a number of references associated with this webinar and the webinar is going to be saved. And, and actually, if you'd like the slide deck, I'd be glad to distribute that. Uh, maybe we can have it on diatoms.org and <clears throat> there will be a lot of future webinars if you want them on, on these kinds of topics. So I'm going to organize this presentation uh, based on a paper that I wrote a number of years ago, um, not too long ago, six years ago, but probably wrote it seven, uh, for the Phycological Society of America, a review on using ecological assessments with algae. And um, uh, so this covers a lot of these details and, and really strongly applies to diatoms as well as all algae. And that paper is based on a conceptual model that was developed as part of a, a workshop with a variety of different scientists. Um, <clears throat> and this model was published in, in this uh, a book that was meant for resource managers. And the people that participated in putting this all together were EPA personnel, personnel from consulting firms, particularly Tetra Tech, um, uh, members of the in, from the industry and environmental groups, and, uh, and a few academics that were present at a, a CTAC meeting at, in Pelston, Michigan, at the University of Michigan's biological station. So there's a lot of input to this general organization from those groups. And so that serves as an outline that I think ties in and emphasizes some of the things that we want to emphasize when we think about how to use our tools in ecological assessment. So the four basic elements of that conceptual model of how to use information in ecological assessments are designing assessments, then characterizing condition with the information that you gather, 
diagnose the stressors, and then use that information in management decisions. So in designing assessments, it's really important to establish what your goals are. And we, we base that on a variety of different things, and I'll talk about uh, a few goals and give some examples in the different um, uh, case studies that I talk about. Uh, as part of designing as assessments, you want to develop a conceptual model of the system that you're, you're studying so that you can think about a sampling plan at the right spatial and temporal scales with the right variables. And uh, of course, those variables include things like physical chemical attributes of the aquatic systems, land use, geology, climate, a lot of different natural factors. But for in-system, in in-habitat in type um, uh, variables, we think about thinking of the biota as an important part of that for a variety of different reasons. So then we need to select indicators. And that's what I'm going to talk about a bit today is how we use the different tools in our toolbox for different goals. And um, there are a lot of different kinds of indicators associated with diatoms and other algae, biomass, nutrient chemistry, toxins that are produced, diversity, whether it's measured as species richness, evenness, or Shannon diversity, uh, or as uh, O over E, the observed versus expected reference taxa at a site. Um, and I'm not going to talk about those too much today. They'll come up in a couple of examples, but I'm not going to talk about those too much. I'm going to particularly talk about where the diatoms provide really extraordinary strength. And, and that's in using taxon traits of species of diatoms and then use those taxon traits with relative abundances to uh, uh, develop taxonomic metrics of biological condition or even ecological condition. So we can use these taxonomic metrics potentially in multi-metric indices to infer biological condition, or we can use these taxonomic metrics to infer stressors. And so I'm going to be emphasizing how those two different uses, actually to measure biological condition or to infer stressors, where I define stressors as contaminants and habitat alterations by humans, uh, so here we're talking about using metrics to infer physical and chemical conditions um, in the stressors. So we'll take those, then those, those examples of developing those metrics and apply them in one case study where we're going to use it to measure biological condition. And then actually three case studies where we're going to use them uh, in stressor response relationships, identifying thresholds and responses, and then using that information uh, in one case where it's actually been used to develop water quality criteria. I'm not going to talk about diagnosing stressors and management, just to kind of keep things under control a little bit, but not too much. <clears throat> um, so let's start off with the goals uh, and, and just some examples of goals that could be used. And one of the overarching uh, sets of goals are associated with the Clean Water Act which has a number of different, uh, which is designed to protect a number of different uses of waters, including things like navigation and, and drinking water, but also the ecological or the aquatic life use of waters, where we want to go out and measure the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of a system, or we want to be, measure how that system is supporting fish, shellfish, and wildlife. So those are two goals of assessments, is to go out and characterize those things. And it turns out that diatoms are used around the world to do this kind of assessment, uh, potentially not as explicitly as in the U.S., but uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, diatoms are used quite extensively for these goals of assessing aquatic life use of waters. Another direction for uh, thinking about goals, and it certainly happens in state agencies, um, and it's an interest of the EPA is to think about ecosystem services as another set of goals. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that too much today. Um, probably not at all, really. Um, but it's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about how to use diatoms and any ecological indicators in characterizing uh, ecosystems, is thinking about the services that they provide. 
aquatic life use being one of those. So why use diatoms in ecological assessment when we have these kinds of goals? First, they're really good indicators of, of biological condition and stressors. And the reasons for that is because there are so many species and they are so sensitive to physical chemical conditions and the, the response. <clears throat> uh, uh, there are, because there are so many species and they're so sensitive to physical chemical conditions, they tend to be really robust and responsive metrics. So they're robust, robust to space and time. They work across broad regions <clears throat> and uh, they tend to be uh, very sensitive to the changes. The species are readily identifiable. There's a relatively low cost of sampling and analyzing samples compared to other biological groups. Uh, the algae diatoms in particular reproduce and respond rapidly to environmental change, although there are caveats to that, but um, they, we want to keep that in mind. Uh, there's a, an extraordinarily broad temporal index period um, for, uh, our, for the diatoms and the metrics that we use, that they work around the, around the seasons. I mean, you can even go, we've, we've gone to Kentucky streams and scraped dry rocks to get some idea of what the diatoms on those dried rocks are and <clears throat> what they tell us about the environment. Um, and then the diatoms are found in all the aquatic habitats. So for example, with the, the National Aquatic Resource Surveys, uh, uh, diatoms have been explored in the wetlands, uh, lakes, streams and rivers, and they could be used in the coastal zones as well. And the value of that is it provides a consistent group of aquatic organisms, biota, that would be used in all the habitats and it provides for consistency in the assessments across those habitats. Another reason that diatoms are, are really valuable, particularly associated with thinking about stressors and biological condition, is that diatoms are really important in ecosystems. They're, they're, so they're, they should be measured as parts of biological condition. They're as close to the microbes as you can get to thinking about biogeochemical cycling. Again, there's a high diversity of organisms. In most habitats, they're the base of the food web, and they're important for some physical attributes of systems and functions of systems beyond biogeochemical cycling, where they stabilize substrates, sands and silts, so that they're not constantly moving, and creating habitat for microorganisms in those situations, or myofauna, for example, moving through stabilized sands and silts. As all biota, the reason for including them in assessments uh, for non-aquatic life use reasons is that they can, re uh, they can sense and detect physical chemical changes in the habitats that were actually not measured. And particularly for diatoms, <clears throat> diatoms are valuable because they record the history of the habitat in sediments like in lakes and wetlands, reservoirs, where sediments deposit. There's a nice chronology of sediments down through the depth of those sediments. And another thing is that we've suspected this, but um, it, it's, it really is true that diatom indicators of physical chemical conditions and using them as stressor indicators like this can be actually more accurate and precise than one-time sampling and assay of those physical chemical conditions. And that's particularly true in streams and wetlands where physical chemical conditions vary on a daily and, and temp, uh, uh, within with hourly and daily schedules because of diurnal changes in, in habitat and uh, weather related changes in, in those habitat conditions. So diatoms are really valuable in ecological assessments. So now I want to give some examples of, of how we use them and we'll start off with kind of how to get the information and then up and and um, uh, for the taxonomic traits and using the taxonomic metrics and then uh, talk about two system uh, two two uh, two sets of examples where we'll talk about characterizing condition uh, one for biological condition and one for stressors so first taxonomic traits and metrics so again, emphasizing 
how to use these uh, tools in a, in a toolbox. <clears throat> we, we use traits to calculate uh, uh, biological condition, and we use traits to calculate metrics for stressors. So metrics for biological condition and metrics for stressors. And there are a number of different kinds of traits that we use. <clears throat> um, so one of the classics is using the percent reference or tolerant tax set, those that are characteristic of low and high disturbance. And we might refer to those as disturbance guild um, traits, uh, sensitivity of disturbance to uh, human activities. And these are typically developed by using indicator species analysis. The same can be done for physiological guilds, or what I refer to as physiological guilds, where organisms are sensitive and tolerant to specific stressors. So for example, nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, pH and conductivity. And we can simply characterize the tax as low or high, phosphorus, nitrogen, pH, conductivity, set, uh, silt, and other kinds of uh, stressors. There's the group of morphological guilds. Uh, which strongly relate to ecosystem functions, particularly food web structure. So plankton and benthos, filamentous algae, uh, whether they're adnate. And then things like modal and non-modal also relate to the function of the system. <clears throat> so when we move down now to metrics for, or traits for stressor metrics, we can think about the some of the traits that are for biological condition that actually work for stressors too. So the ideas are not mutually exclusive, but you want to choose the right tool for your goal, whether it's bio measuring biological condition or stressors. So the traits up above can be used or other kinds of traits. Historically, regression coefficients have used and simple models for uh, regression models for predicting pH based on relative abundance of, of a set of species in the habitat. Uh, they can be used in the more common optimum tolerances. So the optimum tolerances of species become those traits. And um, more recently, people in Scandinavia have used the boosted regression tree um, regression models to um, basically extract species traits uh, for their roles in those models to predict stressor conditions. And these traits can be found in a number of different places. There's, those, there's some old classic ones. Uh, some, what many people may not know about the uh, compilation that Rex Lau did for the US EPA in 1974. That's actually just a remarkable compilation. There's the classic Van Dam uh, traits that are, that are out. But there are a number of newer ones as well. So, uh, and these are just examples. There are lots of them. Uh, Potipova and Charles does, did streams, uh, Stephen Porter did a uh, compilation of things that were used with the USGS program and, and NACWA. <clears throat> uh, I've done things for streams of the, of the West and then used those in subsequent studies um, of streams throughout the US. And uh, we did uh, traits for the lakes of the US. And a uh, classic example in the wetlands is the nice work that uh, Evelyn Geyser and the team from uh, Florida International have done on coming up with uh, phosphorus models for uh, the Everglades. In addition, there are traits on diatoms.org. <clears throat> so whenever these traits are published, it's often hard to get all that information into a paper. Many journals don't want to handle it. So there are typically phrases in there that Contact the authors if you want those trait databases. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure that most of those authors would be willing to get them to you. So don't hesitate to contact them to get the information. It's also a good idea to think about using your own data. Uh, often you'll get pushback because of circularity issues, but they can actually be resolved. In other words, you're using your own data to assess patterns in your own data. You're using your own data to come up with traits and then assessing patterns based on those traits. There are some really good reasons that um, that's not really completely circular. Uh, it might not be as robust as using years and years and years of data from a variety of different regions, but it's not circular or tautological uh, completely. Okay. <clears throat> 
So I want to move on now to providing some examples of characterizing condition, biological condition first, and then physical chemical stressors. And so I'll move through these relatively rapidly just to give you a sense of what they are, how they're done. So the first example is using a multimetric index for assessing biological condition in the National Lakes Assessment, where lots of samples, a thousand samples were taken across the US. They were cores, tops and bottoms were collected of those cores. We used the tops, went through some standard laboratory procedures to get the relative abundance of the species in the tops of these cores. <clears throat> and there were 1,913 taxa observed in those that 1,071 lakes. And we came up with, because these lakes were randomly sampled, we came up with a characteristic, a characterization and a determination of the, the top five diatoms that are found in lakes of the U.S., which is a pretty cool gee whiz number um, and uh, listing that, you know, these are the five most common diatoms in lakes across the U.S. So to develop this index, this index of biological condition, we went through several steps. The first was to conceptualize what we wanted to measure for a biological condition. The second was we then calculated all these metrics. We evaluated the performance of the metrics based on a variety of different performance characteristics. And then we selected metrics that had a high range a high responsiveness to human disturbance, a low signal to noise ratio, which is basically measuring temporal variability, temporal variability and then a high independence among, among the metrics so that we're not weighting the metrics in one, uh, the, the multi-metric index in one direction or another because of a bunch of correlations between metrics. And then we calculated the multi-metric index. So I'll take you through this really quickly. One of the ways we conceptualized this was based on an existing characterization of what biological condition is. <clears throat> so um, uh, uh, Susan Jackson and Davies have published a paper in 2006 in Ecological Applications that basically characterized this. As, uh, you know, how do you measure biological condition with sensitive and tolerant taxa? Looking at organism condition, which we could do with diatoms, for example, ab abnormal valves. And diatoms in particular are particularly good at using structure of the community, the species composition, to infer function of the ecosystem. And I'll give a little example of that. So we, can, we want to think about and conceptualize what we're measuring based on how do people, and in this case the US, US EPA, how do they define biological conditions? So we want to select metrics based on those ideas. And we use a multi-metric index because it, more, it can more thoroughly characterize that biological condition. So then after conceptualizing what we want to measure, we go out and calculate those metrics. We calculated over 100 potential metrics. We characterize the performance statistics for these. We check for independence among them. And then we ended up <coughs> um, selecting those metrics. And here's an example of just one of the the performance attributes, and it's whether it's as simple as do they clearly distinguish between reference and disturbed lakes. So this is the, the way we measured responsiveness was with the Man Whitney U or Z statistics associated with <clears throat> this distinction between reference and disturbed uh, conditions. So then for the NLA, and uh, we followed a, a kind of a tradition of selecting metrics in five categories of metrics. And those categories are similarity to reference conditions. So for example, we use percent reference taxa of all the taxa that are there and the percent disturbed taxa of all the taxa that were there and they were positively and negatively related to uh, uh, human disturbance. The reference and trash or reference and disturbed uh, condition of those lakes. We included diversity, even though it wasn't particularly responsive, but we considered it an important attribute to include, and it didn't affect the, the multimetric indices negatively, so we included that in there. We had a couple of growth form um, attributes, which we can relate to food webs and habitats. Uh, 
we included stressor metrics and at the national scale, nitrogen and phosphorus, not pH, not conductivity, those things like that, really pulled out as important metrics. And we could get into the idea of using some of those other stressor metrics in, in a characterization of biological condition, <clears throat> but that's beyond what I want to talk about now. And then, and then one of the common uh, categories is just straight species composition. How did genera change, or how do families or orders change? Um, and in the, so for diatoms, we use genera so that the metrics that were slow, uh, selected were percent actinidiums, which respond positively, um, uh, are high in high quality waters, and then cochineus, cyclotella, and stephanodiscus, which are typically low in high quality waters. And we thought that these metrics really relate to the goals of what they're trying to do in the National Lakes Assessment. First, they're, we use these five categories that are consistent with how they were done in other programs. They characterize a number of different attributes of biological condition, and they were sensitive to a number of different stressors. So after selecting the metrics, we combine them together in a multi-metric index for the National Lakes it was a little different because it was hierarchical. We grouped them to prevent overweighting of one category or another. But the first thing was we just rescaled them to a 100 point score and then made sure that uh, a high value of a metric indicated a high value of biological condition. And we averaged them together hierarchically, first by category and then across the categories. And we ended up with this Lake Diatom Condition Index uh, that is for the entire country, un, uh, unadjusted for natural conditions, and we got good separation between reference and, and uh, highly disturbed conditions. So we were happy with that performance. That was then used in the National Lakes Assessment <clears throat> where the conclusion was that 47% of our lakes are in good condition, 27 are in fair, and 23 are in, in poor condition. So that is how we would use, an example of how we would use diatom metrics to assess biological condition. The next thing to do is to think about how we use them in stress and response relationships and look for thresholds and use that information to provide really strong and um, you know, public support for water quality criteria. So I'm going to talk about these two examples down below of where diatoms record history and sediments and diatoms infer stressor conditions so well that we should use them to do that. The, I think, really one of these seminal papers in the U.S. Uh, in, in ecological assessment was associated with the work that was done in the Adirondack Mountains to show how uh, atmospheric deposition was correlated to the acidification of lakes in the, Ad in the Adirondacks. And Don Charles uh, and a group of other scientists did this work. So the first thing they did is they used, <clears throat> they looked around a lot, a lot of different lakes and they developed <clears throat> a model based on regression actually, uh, versus uh, uh, optimum tolerances of species to infer pH based on diatom species composition. And that, then they use that model over here on the left to, to then determine uh, what the inferred pH was for lakes, a whole set of lakes. And here are two of them that show the strong recent acidification starting from uh, pHs that are around six in Big Moose that then rapidly decreased in the last 50 years at the time that this was actually published rapidly decreased down to around five. And the same thing kind of uh, pattern was observed with the recent rapid acidification of these lakes. And this information was key in the development of, of policies to stop acid rain um, and control sulfate deposition in particular. Um, another example of using diatoms as indicators of stressors is in more uh, is in current conditions, <clears throat> and this example shows us how diatoms help us resolve stressor response relationships because they really are potentially 
more accurate than one-time measurement of physical chemical conditions. So this is a project where we measured um, uh, chlorophyll, chlorophyll, species composition of diatoms and vertebrates and a whole lot of things in about 60 streams in Kentucky and 60 streams in Michigan. And we, when we look at the chlorophyll phosphorus relationship on the left, <clears throat> you don't see much of a relationship there. I mean, there's a nice linear relationship, but there's a huge amount of variability around that, that line. If we then substitute a diatom index that was actually developed in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia in the Mid-Atlantic Highlands and an EPA project in the Mid-Atlantic Highlands. If we substitute this myotrophic status index for phosphorus, we find this nice asymptotic relationship between biomass of, of, uh, of algae in Michigan and in Kentucky. <clears throat> um, so two really different ecoregions and how nutrients affect algae in the streams um, uh, based on thinking about how diatoms see phosphorus in the habitat versus uh, just measuring total phosphorus. Part of this is the SRP, the uh, soluble reactive phosphorus, the bioavailable phosphorus, the particulate phosphorus, and dissolved organic phosphorus components of phosphorus. Again, it's a little too detailed to get into here, but, but one of the ways you can use this data is if we then back calibrate what's a Maya TSI mean with respect to total phosphorus, we see that around 15 micrograms per liter, so a Maya TSI of 3.5 is equivalent to 15 micrograms per liter, at about that concentration, that's when diatoms become <clears throat> uh, relieved from phosphorus limitation, where productivity of the habitat starts going up, so indicating function of the habitat. And that's a little lower for Kentucky, actually, probably around 10, and it might be, a little, that's probably around 15 or a little bit higher for Michigan. And, and this corresponds really well to experimental work that shows the same kind of release of, of diatom growth rates from nutrient limitation. So a little stressor diagnosis component to it, including experimental results and looking for correspondence. And then the last example that I want to provide is one from the Everglades, which I was fortunate enough to work in during some of the early stages of the Everglade work. And the idea was that all the, there's a lot of agricultural lands north of the Everglades that drain, then the waters from those uh, agricultural lands drain down through canals and then down through these water conservation areas. Um, and the, one of the key problems in the Everglades was losing natural habitat and function of, of the system. And a key attribute in the Everglades, in these open water slough areas of the Everglades, was a floating calcareous algal map. <clears throat> so we did our project up in a, along a phosphorus gradient in the water conservation 2A, along this white line, where uh, water came out of a canal, this bright red line, at an S10 gate, the red area in that red line, and then drained south through water conservation area 2A. So we were able to basically study the effects of this phosphorus gradient on biological condition. <clears throat> and the effect on percent MAC cover was really dramatic. Uh, that far away from the point source in reference condition, there was typically around 80% of that, of, of a slough area that would be covered with this floating calcareous algal map. And then once we got to around 7.75 kilometers from the gate, uh, the sloughs almost never had uh, 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 floating calcareous algal mats in them. So we end up with one benchmark for an ecological change that was considered by many people not to be acceptable. Another change that occurred at almost exactly the same place, and I'm not sure why I used almost, it was at 7.76 kilometers, was there was a strong change in a diatom species composition from basically a large proportion of really sensitive diatoms to almost no sensitive diatoms at that 7.76 kilometers. <clears throat> 
that this this was an observation by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and then we used that <clears throat> using the broad term of we, based on some uh, work that was done by Kurt Richardson's group at Duke Portland Center, where that shows a nice phosphorus gradient as we got closer to the S10 gate and uh, the Hillsborough Canal and farther away, at about 7.6. Uh, 7.76 or 7.75, around eight kilometers, the phosphorus is about 10 micrograms per liter. And these results were used to establish the 10 microgram per liter phosphorus criterion for the Everglades. So uh, in the presentation, I've shown you how we can use diatoms to infer uh, um, aquatic, uh, aquatic life, biological condition, and how these measurements and <clears throat> diatom responses to nutrients or even diatom inferred conditions and nutrients can be used as water quality criteria in water quality standards. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. So here on the chat, um, I have one question already, um, and the question is starts with, I seem to observe a shifting of species composition towards a greater contribution of cyanobacteria versus diatoms with increasing concentrations of nitrate. Have you used cyanobacteria and or soft algae? And do my observations jive with what you have seen? So a higher percentage of cyanobacteria with lower or higher levels of nitrogen? Increasing concentrations of nitrate. Yeah, so uh, I think that might need to be resolved and it might depend on the kind of cyanobacteria because heterocystis cyanobacteria might increase with lower concentrations of nutrients. <clears throat> uh, with lower concentrations of nitrogen, for example. Um, and uh, so you might need to you know, get into the literature a little bit more and find out why <clears throat> the two different patterns might be observed. And you might need to get the species or even strain level, levels of cyanobacteria to figure that out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but there are a number of people that are using both diatoms and non-diatom algae in assessments. And they do increase, they do increase resolution and sensitivity of their assessments. There's a trade-off in costs, so, uh, but uh, there's certainly value in, in um, measuring soft algae and getting the interpretation, but you need to get the interpretation correct. Um, so that question um, is from Tom, Tom Heatherly, and he also added um, he's, uh, the observations were made in Nebraska with a lot of phosphorus um, related to N. Uh, yeah. uh, so this gets into the causal analysis that's really important. <clears throat> and teasing apart nitrogen and phosphorus is really another another talk, but, uh, uh, you know, is it nitrogen or is it phosphorus? And I've seen a lot of correlations where, and I'm not saying that that's the case here, but I've seen a lot of correlations where uh, uh, the correlation's stronger with nitrogen than it is with phosphorus. But I would have difficulty saying that it's causally related to nitrogen than it uh, versus phosphorus. I think it's actually phosphorus that's limiting it. And there are ways to explain that ecologically um, that, make, that could make that true. So <clears throat> causal diagnosis is of, of correlations and relationships is really valuable. And there's a lot of EPA work on that and um, a lot of resources that can be used to help you do that. OK. Um, this person has several questions for you. Um, could you expand on the applicability of assessment in one region to another? Aren't some species region specific? Uh, that turns out to be true. <clears throat> uh, so all the evidence that we got 
currently is that there is a lot of regional variability in species traits. Um, <clears throat> given that, uh, people are using Van Dam's traits and still getting responsive metrics. I don't recommend that, but that speaks to how robust the metrics are. And that's because species are related to each other. And uh, so when you misidentify them, you tend to misidentify them as something with a common trait. Uh, and, there, and then there's a large number of species. You get random error associated with taxonomy and a variety of things. So there's reasons the traits are robust. But I think that it's advisable to work. You know, I mean, you could start with traits from the national uh, uh, assessments, but then you kind of work down and or from one region or another. But then eventually, as you develop your own data, you want to develop your own trait set if you can. That's probably where you'll get the best responsiveness for a variety of different reasons. Do you have any experience in using aerial or terrestrial diatoms for environmental assessment? Not that I can remember. Uh, but, you know, it should, I mean, uh, you might want actually, uh, in that case, it would seem that you would really want to include non diatom algae in your assessments because there's such a large propor uh, proportion of the function of, of area. Actually, Jeff Johansson did work on uh, cyanobacterial crusts and the effects of uh, tanks. <laughs> I think it really was stuff like that uh, on, on cyanobacterial crusts <clears throat> and in, uh, by, the, by the military. So he had a DOE project and they were looking at the effects of tanks on cyanobacterial crusts and then the rest, the, the recovery of those crusts. So, um, I mean, uh, you know, the algae are everywhere. Um, they may not be the best indicators everywhere, but um, I think they've got a lot of potential. Get the right tool for the right goal. Okay. So anyone who has um, any other questions, feel free to enter those in the chat box. And I will read them out for you. In the meantime, Jan, did you want to get into any um, of your extra slides? Well, there were some things we cut out, for example, in the, in the discussion of, of um, uh, so here, here is a reference, here's a list of all the references. Um, that we're using in the talk. Um, yeah, we have some supplementary material in the, in the slide deck in the PowerPoint presentation. And so it, included in that um, are examples of uh, diatom data for those that uh, don't know what that looks like. Um, there are some examples of conceptual models that kind of emphasize this distinction between measuring stressors and how that information is used in assessment management, measuring biological condition and measuring ecosystem services. Um, so that, that's just, these are just examples of the conceptual models. There's an example of how to calculate uh, weighted average optima with the kind of the, the, the lesson that it's just remarkably simple mathematically, yet so powerful. And one of, one of my favorite comments from somebody that I respect a lot, uh, who's a really good statistician and knows diatoms well, um, many of you probably know Yang Dong Pan. We were at a meeting where we were using all different kinds of an EPA meeting, using all different kinds of <clears throat> ways to calculate metrics and, and, and uh, you know, no, no matter how sophisticated the statistics were at that time, and we didn't have booster regression tree and machine learning at that time, but we had, um, general additive models and a variety of different things. We kept testing these other tools and, and, and uh, but the weighted average models just were really powerful and robust 
and uh, Ann actually was addressing the whole group and he said, you know, it's just diatom indicator magic. Um, but there are good statistical and probability reasons for why that magic is true. Uh, so an example of more details on metric performance and then some things on how, uh, uh, how do you how do you account for natural variability among sites? Uh, and um, a simple model for that that we developed for the National Lakes Assessment. So, okay, and here's a comment that is a bit related to what you said. Um, it's great that research continues on development of diatom indicators, including work with existing um, NARS data. Due to issues of taxonomic consistency with the underlying diatom data, we don't have an indicator we can apply in any of the national surveys, but look forward to continued work on the taxonomic consistency um, and research on assessment endpoints. Okay. Did you want to discuss that or? <laughs> Do you want to make a comment about that, Jan? Well, we, we, I've used the National Lakes Assessment data and the National Rivers and Streams Assessment data with some pretty successful um, uh, metrics and multi-metric indices. And uh, so uh, I think taxonomic consistency is important, <clears throat> but if the metrics work, yeah, uh, um, I think it's a shame not to use them. We have another question here. Um, could you speak a little bit about how to avoid circularity issues when you're using your own data to evaluate stressors? Yeah. So the circularity issue is basically, um, you know, associated with, you know, you're developing your own traits uh, with your data set and you're saying that, well, these are the sensitive species and these are the tolerant species. And it's basically based on what you observe. <clears throat> well, that's fundamentally true with almost all observational work that we do. We go out and we characterize a system based on what we observe. And we're seeing a shift from one set of species to another set of species with our data set. <coughs> And we're just calling the, the ones that are in low human disturbance sensitive to disturbance. And we're calling the ones that are at high levels of human disturbance tolerant to disturbance. So that's just a simple characterization of how species composition has changed along the gradient of human disturbance, for example. There's nothing wrong with that. That's done ecologically all the time. To add confidence to that work and to break the circularity, um, I mean, really the best way is to use, be using metrics and traits, traits from other generated other places, um, which actually work remarkably well. And uh, in, in some examples that I've, actually examples that I've just shown you, two of them, uh, the National Lakes Assessment, or no, not actually like National Lakes Assessment was not, our National Rivers and Streams assessment was work was based on traits developed in another project. And the myotrophic status index was developed in a different ecoregion for a different project versus Kentucky and Michigan. But so the ultimate is to use existing traits that are standard for a region or for a, a nation and, and then apply them to future work. <clears throat> but short of that, uh, one way to do it with your own data to generate independence is in the bootstrapping and jackknifing approaches where you leave at least one site, but actually, you know, potentially 20% of your data out, develop the metrics with 80% of the data and apply them to that 20%. And <clears throat> that way you generate a characterization of independence. And that independence is largely related to how representative your samples are of seasonal and temporal changes. Uh, so for example, you might do your study based on a dry summer and then try to go out and apply these metrics to a wet summer. Well, they're, 
you're going to end up with slightly different species traits in those two situations. So <clears throat> over time, you build a robustness in the, you know, um, um, a better characterization of the species traits and the variability in those traits and which species have broad tolerances to one condition over another and reduced weights in the metrics um, due to spatial and temporal error or variability, not error. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, there's a question here. Do the Van Dam, Van Dam metrics relate to currently used trait metrics? Um, <clears throat> yes, kind of. But then there are some really, uh, you need to be careful. In the, and, and the biggest uh, <clears throat> um, challenge is what to do with actinidium minutism. Uh, in, in your uh, assessments. So um, I've seen people use these um, and, and, and in some cases recently, and I think they're better trait sets to use for the US than that. So contact people and get them or go to diatomus.org and use those. Or, uh, and, that, and actually I think that's something that we need to think about is getting trait sets together and so that they're readily available. And we, uh, <clears throat> during the NACWA uh, period, we really talked about trying to get these trait sets together and get them up on the web. And I think many of us were reluctant because, well, you know, we're learning more and should we put a final trait set up and have that become the new Van Dam? And we were a little nervous about that. So we've probably been more reluctant than we should be to have done that. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, that would be a project I think that we should try to work on is making trait sets more readily available. Um, so Van Dam, if you, uh, um, uh, Lavoie, did a project in Canada, and I forget, I think that might have been actually pu published in NABS before it was Freshwater Science. Um, uh, where she um, she used she she looked at that specific question: How well did Van Dam's translate mm -hmm. to her work in Canada? You might look up that paper and get more detailed information. All right, so we have four minutes left. I'll give you a chance for any last-minute questions. Um, if they come through. Um, I want to thank Jan again for an excellent webinar um, and for announcement about future webinars, um, please be on the lookout for emails from diatompcc at gmail.com. I just put that information in the chat um, and if you want to get on the email list, just send me an email um, to that same one. And um, as we said in the beginning of the hour, um, two weeks from now, our speaker will be Marina Potapova, and she will um, talk about uh, the genus Planothidium. And that webinar will be a very specialized uh, topic for taxonomists, analysts, um, systematists. Okay. I don't see any uh, more 